So today's topic is uh, Scrum at Scale, getting the foundations right. Uh, so I, I just wanted to um, touch base on the previous topic. We spoke about the basic foundations of Scrum and Scrum at Scale, and this is going to touch base on um, the similar aspects, but then also a little more deeper. We're going to try and understand the comparison between safe and Scrum at Scale. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll be doing a little bit of comparison about it. So keep you guys engaged with with, with the comparison, and maybe it may have a lot of value to, to if you're working in safe. Uh, and you can compare that with Scrum at Scale. Right, so my name is Mohammed Rauta. I uh, have been in the IT industry for about 20 years um, and uh, serving a lot of uh, agile um, projects and products. So uh, my most of my work has been in the, in the UK and uh, I also work on a lot of transformation projects and coaching a lot of clients. Now, uh, off late, I've been training on um, Scrum at Scale and it's all been virtual. Uh, across, uh, I've had candidates from uh, different uh, areas, uh, Europe, UK, um, and India. And uh, I've worked for uh, several media organizations, banks, and uh, a couple of uh, telecom companies, so Vodafone, Orange. I've also done some um, uh, courses on SPC, so I'm, I'm, I'm on my journey now, so I'm trying to actually uh, compare the uh, the two, the compare safe and scrum at scale, and see how how things can be uh, evolved across different organizations. I've done a lot of talk in um, scrum at scrum alliance uh, gatherings and other uh, other gatherings as well. So uh, all my talks are on YouTube. So please feel feel free to um, search for efficient agile and 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 try and have a look, please. Um, so right. Scrum. Scrum was was designed uh, for a single team. It originally started. If you look at the Scrum guide, it was designed for a single team to deliver and maintain a sustainable pace within the using their optimal capacity. Now, as the company started uh, using more and more products, they started developing more products, services, processes. The usage extended, and uh, we saw that the organization started building, uh, how, forming multiple Scrum teams. But then there were there were problems that came came with this, and you can see that a lot of organizations started to struggle. They started to struggle in terms of prioritizing, in terms of delivering, in terms of uh, organizational refactor. They started struggling with every areas and aspects. So what was the issues that came up? It was observed that as a number of scrum teams within an organization grew, the volume, the speed, and the quality of their output began to fall. Now, because of, because of cross-team dependencies, duplication of work, and communication overhead. When we say organizational refactoring, it talks about the structure, the organization management structure was ineffective to achieve this business agility. And the priorities, there were multiple priorities. Sometimes it used to be a situation where everything becomes number one priority. So all the, the organizations, they started struggling. They were able to do with the single scrum team, but they were not able to do with multiple scrum teams. At some point of time, they also felt that the scrum within their environment was inconsistent. In most organizations, what I've seen is the stand up becomes a focus point where the status update takes place and not focusing on what needs to be done up to achieve the sprint goal. It was, it was all of us getting, it was, it was all about getting, what have you done and uh, why do you do this? And it was all about questioning them. It wasn't, it wasn't a two-way communication. It is a huge struggle between the team members and the scrum masters. There was no collaboration happening. So everybody started having their own half-baked scrum. At, at situations where the team wasn't performing or wasn't able to deliver, they started increasing the number of developers or testers, thinking that this is going to increase the delivery cycle. But no, you're going to create unstable teams. And it's and the eventual result is what? You're going to be, it's going to slow, it's going to be really hard, and it's going to be painful. The teams, the organizations stop thinking about interrupts. They, they, they were not continuously improving and nothing was getting done in the sprint and 
and it used to be a mini waterfall within the sprints, within the scrum area. So they were implementing a few areas of scrum, like doing the stand-ups, like doing a, maybe a sprint planning, and that was sprint planning in a marathon fashion, maybe for two days or three days, and uh, having a backlog that is not well-defined, well-prioritized, not well-designed. Some of the common symptoms I've heard from people were, we have no dedicated product owner and SM roles. The basis of Scrum Guide mentions that a team has a product owner and a Scrum Master. That's as simple as that. The team requires a product owner and Scrum Master. That's your Scrum team. And some of the events never used to take place. Now, backup refinement is an optional event, but it is an improvement. If you actually do a backup refinement within your sprint cycle, it's going to refine your backlog and it's going to put you in a better place. When you go into sprint planning, you won't have a marathon. And what about transparency? Lack of transparency. You see a lot of uh, um, things were not visible to the teams, not to the leadership teams. So everything was kind of hidden or the features were not categorized in such a way that everybody gets a view of it. And sometimes everything becomes number one priority. It becomes a priority because it's, I like the feature. I love the feature. I need that feature in my product. Is it going to provide you business value? Is it going to meet your customer needs? You have to think about it. Some of the common symptoms, of such, such, such symptoms actually cause a lot of problem. And it can deteriorate your product. You can lose out on market share. You won't be there. It's going to, your, your competitors could deliver your products at a faster pace, but with all these problems, it's, you're not going to meet the market needs. One of the other, other factors I've seen is, everybody says that agile is something that goes down there, and that's true. We create a fragile system. Having a proper waterfall leadership or a management sitting on top and thinking that agile is only for IT, or it's only for uh, a few developers and testers and let them do the product. This will result in something where you will not have sustainability. If you want to look, if you're looking for stronger and long-term sustainability, you need to build an environment that is transparent and also kind of help the waterfall management team to move into an agile area or move into an area where the managers become more leaders. This traditional management hierarchy creates project teams, but then most of the scaling frameworks, they try, they are often used to provide scaffolding for the legacy organization until it can evolve. So until a certain number of time or period, you need this transition layer. This transition layer provides a kind of insulation and must ultimately be removed to get high performance. We are asking you to stay with that. Eventually, it needs to be moved across. This is a typical thing, command and control, micromanagement. What about the decision making? The team is not empowered to do it. You have people being controlled. You have your employees who are disengaged. Some want to go to, go to the office only to work because they want to pay the bills or they want to do they really love the work. Are they fully engaged? Are they fully involved? Do they get enough trust? Does their uh, organization and team managers listen to them? These are a couple of questions we have to ask each other. We'll have to look into those things and see if it really works, works within our environment. When you scale in such an environment, it won't stay. It's going to crash. It's going to fall down. You need to have a solid foundation or the whole thing will fall apart. It's not going to, the base has to be really strong. We have our rule books. We've got the scrum guide, which talks about all the basic artifacts, the principles and everything. It's, it's a small book. It's, it's, it's got like few pages to read and that's it. All you need to do is understand that and implement that in your organization. Dr. Jeff Sutherland, he developed the Scrum at scale based on the fundamental principles behind Scrum. What is the fundamental principle behind Scrum? Complex adaptive systems theory, the game theory, and his work in biology. So how you can take a Scrum team and that can be consistent to the Scrum guide 
and you can start expanding that across hundreds of teams, even thousands of teams. All you need to do is to follow the basic foundation of Scrum. Nothing new, nothing more, nothing less. Remember, if you try and introduce any extra roles, or if you introduce any teams that are not Scrum teams, this is going to slow down your implementation and cripple your transformation. I've seen a lot of agile transformation projects taken off. They work for two, three years, and and after that, it's it's gone. It's nowhere. They say agile is not working, Scrum isn't working, and you know we're having problems. We are better off doing waterfall approach. It's the basis. It's the foundation that's not strong. That's what's causing the problem. Let's have a look at the Scrum and Skill Framework. Now, if we look back at the basics of Scrum, it talks about a few things. It talks about the what, the product, and the how, the process. That's what we have in Scrum and Scale. This, the same care is taken in Scrum and Scale so that these two are accountable and they can work together in an orderly fashion. This eliminates this cycle, the cycle what we have here, this eliminates wasteful organizational conflicts that keeps teams from achieving their optimal productivity. Now, because Scrum at scale, they have they have uh, components. It allows an organization to customize their transformation strategy and implementation. Now that's a big flexibility, right? It's not a prescriptive framework you can start looking at the components that's actually more suitable for your environment and start working on those things. So it gives you the ability to target incrementally prioritized change efforts in the area that's most valuable or the most in need of adaptation and then progress to the others. You've got the team level process. If you look at that, that's a part of the Scrum Master Cycle. And then you've got the Strategic Vision, which is a part of the Product Owner Cycle. And the Leadership Support in between. You've got the Executive Action Team and the Executive Meta Scrum Team. The Vision, the Product Backlog, the Value Streams, the Process, everything gets aligned to achieve what to achieve a continuous flow in delivery. Now, its components, they all work together. In order to make the organization agile in the business sense. On the right side, we have the product owner cycle and the left, we have the scrum master cycle. The scrum teams, they focus on continuous improvement. That's what we see here. And removing impediments in order so that they can coordinate with each other. Impediments becomes the biggest problem when you start scaling. There's problems within a scrum team, there's problems within multiple scrum teams as well. So the impediment removal process is what you have to take into account. And the cross-team coordination, how can you remove the dependencies? And once you're done with that, all you need to do is the team of teams or the release team, they start working to deliver the product and get continuous feedback. It's a loop. It's a cycle. That's what we do in a normal Scrum team. We start developing, we get feedback, we start working on it, we do all the sprint uh, events to action all these things, and then time to market is important. One of the key aspects is the leadership support. And that's where we have these two entities, the executive action team and the executive meta Scrum team. When implementing a network of teams, you have to start with small network of teams. We call it a team of teams or reference model prior to scaling. Start with small set of teams and ensure that you follow the Scrum Guide and it has to be performing well. Now these teams will successfully implement Scrum and the rest of the organization has, has a function that's going on. And these teams become an example and a prototype for scaling Scrum. So any deficiencies, any thing that happens within this area while implementation that gets addressed. So any blockers like organization agility, any issues that you have 
that can actually frustrate the teams can be resolved here with the leadership support. So you are starting to build a foundation. You start with a small pilot and then build on. Now addressing the dependencies is essential. That's the key thing. All the dependencies can be addressed. You can see what are the initial problems that's cropping up and try and work that out. Now, if we go back to the root of Scrum, look at this lean in the 1950s, then, then we had Scrum in the 1990s, and later we have the agile values that came in 2001. The focus was more value, higher quality, empowered people, and reduced risk. And most of the work was around process dynamics and model control, and everything's about the uh, empirical process. And if you look at the teams, the teams are like cells. The people, the teams, the organizations, they are like cells. They're like complex adaptive systems. That's why we have, when you look at the uh, Scrum definition, it talks about complex adaptive systems. They are complex adaptive systems that change through small increments. Accept the change, accept the feedback, improve your product, release it again. That's the, that's the fashion. Release faster, get the feedback, release again. That's important. And all these complex systems, they evolve through a series of stable states. Now, formalizing the Scrum process was based on the empirical process design. And they are transparency, inspection, and adapting. And we look at the goals, get the, the more value, the higher quality, empowered people. What do we mean by empowered people? The teams can make decisions. They know how to tackle the problems. Give them the freedom. That's important. We don't want to have that centralized kind of decision making. Value-driven culture. So Scrum at scale aims to build an organization culture that's healthy through the pillars of empirical process and Scrum values. So what are they? The transparency, inspection, and adaptation. And the Scrum values, openness, respect, courage, focus, and commitment. Now Scrum at scale helps the organization, organization thrive by supporting a positive team learning environment. This is important, a positive team learning environment for working at a sustainable pace. We want to go fast, we want to be sustainable, and we need to have a learning environment. We need an environment that is positive. We don't want an unhealthy environment. We don't want the negative aspects of it. While putting the customer at the forefront. So customer is key. We are going to deliver value to the customer. That's important. Now with openness, supports the transparency into all the work and processes. And without it, there is no ability to inspect. And then we attempt to adapt for the better. Simple, right? Transparency, inspection, adaptation. Without transparency, I cannot inspect. And if I don't, if I don't have an op opportunity or the courage or the openness to inspect, I cannot adapt. I cannot change. That's the basis. That's the foundation for any organization. Whether you're implementing Scrum or Kanban, or if you're implementing any kind of system, these values will stay intact in an organization you have to implement this is your basis and foundation scrum values talks about the basic things about transparency inspection adaptation if you look at the sustainable agile operating system this is what we want we want to build an os that is sustainable the role of the managers needs to change they have to become leaders. We are not trying to eliminate them. We are not trying to remove them from the job. We want the management to empower the teams, the people. That's important. Coach them. One of the one of the competency of coaching is to empower your team members, support them in their journey, not command and control. So we have to build that coaching mindset. To get your managers to be trained to focus on coaching. Coach, they have to coach the teams. Why do we have to coach the teams? Because the teams need to become self-organized and self-managed. 
and in turn the managers become leaders that's important look at spotify and sa they took the direction the teams will then self form and they start working on a prioritized backlog to maximize flow they are motivated they feel motivated be autonomous look at the agile principles and those values it talks about motivation it talks about uh, being uh, simple being keep keeping simple it talks about inspection adaptation it talks about everything it's the same thing what we have in the scrum values if you want to go into a sustainable state this is where we have to move have an agile operating system that can help you If I compare this with Scrum at scale with SAFE, if I compare Scrum at scale with SAFE, so we have a similar approach in SAFE. That's a team. That's the technical team. It's a Scrum team. You've got the lean agile leadership support. Similar to what we have here. And this layer is the essential part of SAFE, where you have the teams, you have a product owner, you have a Scrum master, and then you have your Scrum and your Kanban, you have both. And you do a PI planning with different iterations and where you deliver value. So we do the similar thing at Scrum at scale, but with the support of leadership, two leadership groups the executive meta scrum and the executive action team the values the mindset the agile manifesto safe lean agile principles all fall into the same thing now as we scale we have different things coming up you have business owners you've got the rtes they're equivalent to the scrum of scrum's master in scrum at scale Looking at the frameworks, if you look at both the frameworks, Scrum at scale and SAFE, they encourage you to work on a dual operating system. You cannot go into an organization and eliminate the entire hierarchy of the system. Or you can't do a big bang transformation. You go to a company today and you say, we're going to remove everybody and we're going to start doing agile and Scrum. That's not the case. So what we need to do is you have to do a small, do at small intervals by building the reference model that works well within the organization to expose and solve some of the organizational impediments. That's the reason we do that. So if you look at the, the diagram here, you can see a guiding coalition, the EMS and the EAT, the executive action team, that's a leadership team. And that's what we do in SAFE. A guiding process, a guiding coalition is required. So if you try and do a big bang transformation, it's not going to work. It's going to take time and the organization is going to fall apart. If you look at the roles within the Scrum at scale and safe, you've got the Scrum team, Scrum master, product owner. You have a set of agile teams, you have Scrum teams here. And when you start expanding that, you have Scrum of Scrums. Yeah, this is called a team. The Scrum of Scrums is a release team. It is a team of teams, just like how you have teams, multiple teams in, in um, SAFE, like Agile release trains and everybody. And you have an RTE there. The RTE's role, release train engineer's role, is similar to a Scrum of Scrums master who handles a release mechanism here. So it's the incrementally, the Scrum of Scrum's master facilitates the events, talks about the dependencies and addresses those and escalates that across to the leadership teams. They're almost similar. This is the title change. Now, why do we want to have a reference model? The reason is implementing the Scrum values and all the roles that is there, that's important. So you need to use your basis of Scrum Guide. And in SAFE, it uses the same thing. You have, when you're creating your Scrum teams or Agile teams, it follows a Scrum Guide. It's the same thing. Except that you're, you become a SAFE Scrum Master. You may have to go a little bit more towards the product specific. 
you understand the product and you can go through a course called safe scrum master to understand the product now as i said sos is a release team it is not an event the event that takes place is called the sds starting with the scaled daily scrum and as that event reflects your daily scrum so the ideal state is for a scrum team to be an independent path to production that's what we want to achieve right independent path to production and we have a similar thing here called the agile release train to focus and try and aim to release to the market to release to the customer it's more customer centric so the scrum of scrums is a team of multiple teams that replicates this similar thing ideal in scale it's you form a team and you start scaling all your events for example if you have a daily scrum it's a scale daily scrum a retrospective is called a scale daily retro, scale retrospective now each team within the scrum of scrums must satisfy the team process improvement so that's what we looked at the first component was a team process and what is what does the team do they have some action that they need to they need to deliver quality tested product they need to work on prioritized backlog items they have to look at uh, shipping the items faster to the market so all these factors work and that's the duties of the agile release train as well other areas of safe and scrum at scale if we compare them we've got an agile practice team or the eat in scrum and scale the focus is on on building an agile ecosystem within the organization it ensures the quality of scrum across the organization <clears throat> just like what we have called as lace or the center of excellence in safe safe has a few core values <clears throat> similar to the scrum values and pillars and the house of lead and the principles we've got those principles which talks about a few things about economic views uh, about the centralized um, about working in collaboration and all these factors <coughs> excuse me now the safe house of lean talks about alignment transparency built-in quality and program execution <coughs> which is similar to our values driven culture One of the things you have to understand is that Scrum at Scale, with the leadership support, it provides a minimal viable bureaucracy. And this minimal viable bureaucracy is, is the leadership support, is having a guiding coalition. <coughs> it's what we see in even in the PR planning and some of the Scrum events we have all the leadership teams supporting the teams supporting everybody clarifying getting things aligned <clears throat> now if we compare some of the areas of scrum and scale with safe for each scrum of scrums we have a shared common backlog that feeds a network of teams and it requires a product on a team including a chief product owner who becomes a final authority to order these things now the teams they do it the team start working on their own backlog and when they work <coughs> with the scrum of scrums they start coordinating with each other building alignment and delivering an incremental product now we we look at scaling the scrum master cycle and we also look at scaling the product on the team now they coordinate with each other and work together that's the key factor here so we want to work with the how and the what now having the product owner team enables a network design of product owners which scales along with that associated scrum of scrums now if you look at the solution side of it you look at if you start moving up <clears throat> if you look at the solution side of it they do the same thing you have the solution trained engineers you have uh, the solution architects working together in safe now 
in in larger implementations the scrum of scrums gets expanded like what you see here i can highlight that in red so you see a scrum of scrums and it has its own entities and they all collaborate with the eat so as you scale each component becomes interface to other teams that's important because that reduces the communication overhead if you look at the bureaucracy and hierarchy this is what we want to aim at try and have a decentralized decision making that's one of the key factors that we want to achieve but this it's going to be completely difficult a micromanaged centralized decision making that's what that's 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 something which we don't need and both these products if you look at scrum at scale and safe we try and aim at getting a proper decision making done it's decentralized you need dedicated support from leadership and that's why we call it as minimal viable bureaucracy and why do we what what do they do they provide challenging prioritized goals to the teams they eliminate organizational debts and impediments so if your teams or team of teams is actually slowing down how can we eliminate those impediments with the leadership support we need leadership teams to support you to do those things they remove the waste within the value stream mapping as we have the vision we build the value streams and as that flows down if there's any impediments the leadership teams work together we try and remove those things and if if the, if the teams or the scrum of scrum teams are not able to resolve those impediments that those impediments go to the execution act, executive action team and they start working on it so what we have here is is pure scrum true scrum across every area now scrum at scale is not new the first scrum at scale prototype was in 1983 so this is where dr jeff sutherland he started working on a business unit for a bank and implemented the first team of teams the network of teams to work together to work collaboratively <clears throat> he worked on this to have few cross-functional teams of about four to five people he had a product manager they really had a prioritized backlog and they were working on a one week cycle monday morning was print planning and then they did their demos on a friday evening this this division was the most loss making division the cost is exceeding the revenue by 30 percentage in six months the revenue exceeded the cost by 30 percent a swing in 60 percent profit margin that's what they achieved with Scrum and Scale. And this was the first prototype that was done. A lot of companies in the early years, individual IDX, IDX is now called uh, GE Healthcare, Fidelity, <clears throat> ABN Amro, I ING, they all used this. They all used Scrum and Scale. So, <clears throat> so if you were working on Scrum and you had multiple teams with you, you, you have utilized Scrum and Scale at some point of time. Look at Spotify. Spotify's case study is there on is there on Scrum and Scale website, and you can see how Spotify implemented the key patterns of Scrum and Scale, the key patterns of Scrum and Scale framework, and helped transform the engineering culture at Spotify. In order to achieve continuous delivery, and they disrupted the entire music stream industry. Spotify's approach was based on scaling scrum what did they do <clears throat> they changed the names they didn't call it scrum they called it a squad they wanted to have different names that's fine that gives you the liberty to change what you want but keeping the basis and the foundation intact they started calling strategy days and that's nothing but the executive meta scrum in the scrum at scale guide where the leaders the stakeholders they used to get together and align with the strategic principles they used to understand what is to what what needs to be done they had coaches 
to train, to support each other, which enable their team to enhance and maintain a positive culture. This is what we want to achieve, right? A positive culture. I mentioned that Scrum at scale, value-driven culture aims to bring about a positive culture. The executive action team in, in the Spotify world, it was a group of product owners, chapter leads, the agile coaches, they got together to solve high level impacts and problems. So this is a great example of where Scrum at scale has been implemented and Spotify has been successful within the music industry. There are a couple of other case studies. I want to talk about this Tesla and 3M. This is one of my favorite case studies. This is, they had only five weeks to deliver a solar panel roof. So you have your roof, which is completely, which can, which can generate electricity, which can uh, also serve as a purpose of a roof for you. Now this was delivered within four to five weeks. With what? With a team, with one team and zero cycles. And then the CEO decided that he's going to implement this across the entire organization. So if you see 3M, they accelerated between 25 to 175 percentage. That was the result. The stock price went up from $84 billion to $149 billion. All these are scrum companies, all the big tech companies. If you look at 3M, if you look at Spotify, Amazon, SAP, Scrum at scale will drive higher quality product, higher market share, and higher company valuation. If you look at the, the uh, look at Apple, Apple was the first company in the history to reach a one trillion dollar valuation. We want to deliver twice the value at half the cost. Scrum at scale is implemented, is designed to scale productivity, to get an organization deliver twice the value at half the cost. If you implement Scrum, if your foundations are strong, Scrum at scale will, will work really wonders for you. I recommend you to have this, uh, to, to read this book. It's called The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. There are a lot of case studies in that, there are a lot of principles, it talks about the basis of Scrum. If you want to learn more about Scrum at scale, uh, I'm doing a lot of classes around um, uh, different time zones. I'm doing it for India, doing it for Australia, Singapore. Um, so this is my virtual environment. Uh, so you get to understand uh, the basis of Scrum at scale, the components, the different things with visuals, concepts, activities, games. And I use a lot of collaborative tools. We have Neurova and Zoom. Um, so yeah, feel free to, uh, to, to speak to Knowledge Hut and uh, they have all the course listings. It's uh, it's available on the website. Uh, try and uh, yeah, try and do some research, and and you can learn about it. Um, what's covered in this course? So we cover a few areas of this of the fail, of the scaling framework. We talk about the scrub, the scrum master cycle, the product owner cycle, and how we can coordinate that, and also build a heat map assessment for you, so you can take it back to your organization and start looking at what areas you want to improve on. So we give you a plan. There's a plan for you to start kickstart, but this is not a prescriptive framework. You can go and work on the components, the areas that you feel that is it's not working and try and improve that. Scrum at scale is a joint venture between Scrum Alliance and Scrum Inc. So towards the end of the course, there's a certificate process. There's a test and it's quite simple. At the end of the test, once it's done, you get the certified Scrum at scale practitioner. So, yeah, that, that's that's the thing. So we, we cover this over two days. It's all virtual. We've got an environment to do it. Stay connected. I'm on LinkedIn. And uh, you can email me at uh, info at efficientagile.com. I'm on Twitter. And also subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's called Efficient Agile. I've got a few videos about Scrum values, a few presentations that I did in my past. Um, feel free to kind of contact me, connect me. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to talk about it, uh, to discuss different things. Uh, stay safe. Yeah. Thank you.